Bertie Smalls became the first supergrass. In return for shopping his associates, one of Britain's most brutal armed robbers was allowed to go free. He was guaranteed immunity from prosecution and kept all his money. But he dared not show his face in the underworld. What were you thinking at the time? I was thinking, how am I going to get out of this lot? No. Why did you decide that you would cooperate with the police? Well, to get myself off the up. To, to, to get my freedom, put someone in it, you know, as cold-blooded as that. The underworld could not believe that one of their own would turn against them. In the spring of 1973, Bobby King was in the High Court, finalising his divorce when the robbery squad arrived. I said to my barrister, I said to her, uh, I think I'm about to be nicked here. I said, I don't want you to move from my side. I said, they can't verbal me up. And um, she said, oh, don't be silly. She said, you can't be arrested for, uh, for getting divorced. I said, I'm not used for being divorced. I said, I'm only about to nick me. <coughs> anyway, when the case was um, finished, when it was adjourned, I was stuck quite close to her. And we went out the door, and all of a sudden, these about five or six coppers just all pulled up and shoot us out. Robert Alice King. You're under arrest. You know what it's for. But he's done the business on you. Small's evidence jailed 20 of his associates for a total of 308 years. Bobby King got 16 years, Don Barrett 17. The underworld's code of silence had been smashed. If you've got a guy who comes along and grasses you and he's going to who's been on the pavement with you, who you've risked your liberty with, who you've uh, got money with, who you've drunk with, who you've had a crack with. At the end of the day, he rolls over, you want to kill the bastard. I mean, you, let's make no bones about that. I say categorically that every grass should have had a bullet in his head. Had Bert had one in the head, that would have finished the supergrass system. It would never have taken off. There was talk of taking out a contract on Smalls, but nobody was prepared to put up the money. Don Barrett served ten years. Prison didn't reform him. I come out with nothing. Um, I hadn't changed uh, my, my line of thought on, on living, and I was released on the Monday. I robbed a security van on the Wednesday, and I robbed a another security van on the Saturday. So I, I hadn't changed, you know, I was still determined to be an armed robber, if you like, and, and, and get the easy money. Within seven months, Barrett was back inside. He blamed the reckless behaviour of an associate. This firm believer in the code of the underworld was beginning to waver. I thought to myself, well, I've just finished the 17 down to a grass. And I'm not going back for another 17 down to Dumbo's, who not only couldn't do their work properly, but got you nicked. Now, rightly or wrongly, and in the eyes of the chaps, that was wrong, I decided that if someone's going to make statements and put people in it, it was going to be me and not them. And it was a cold, calculated decision. And I thought, if someone's going to do this, I'll do it. And I'll fuck you. And that's what I did. There were no bones about it. Afterwards, after you've, you've signed your statements, is when it hits. You then start realising how you've ostracised yourself from, we'll say, the criminal fraternity. Uh, I would think about different people who I was tight with, who I had a good name with, who uh, I trusted, the same as they had trusted me. But it was either that or go back to prison for a very, very, very long time. Barrett, who shows no remorse for any of his robberies, is ashamed of being a supergrass. 
but it was worth it. He could have got 14 years. Sentenced to seven, he served just over two. The atmosphere was diabolical. You've got guys who were throwing their urine out the window above you. They used to, at one time, make us go over to pick our meals up from the kitchen, whereby guys would either spit in it or uh, do whatever they could do. It. And, and it got so bad that some of the super classes would retaliate by jumping over the counter and chase the prisoners. Barrett thought he'd have to go straight. On his release, he worked briefly as a scaffolder, but decided to go back to armed robbery. He found the underworld was pragmatic. People get a certain reputation over the years. They're either good workers or they're not good workers. They're either money getters or they're not money getters. I came out and eventually saw a friend of mine who put me in touch with a guy named David Crowe. He knew that I had just come out of prison. He knew that I was an ex-SG. Uh, he agreed to work with me. We talked about why I'd done the business, and I explained it. But I think the crux of the matter was that it was seen by everybody that once a grass, you could never be a grass again. You couldn't go around a second time. With the experience he'd got over the years, Barrett was confident that he could organise a raid at the Armour Guard security depot. The robbery was planned with chilling precision. We thought we were trying to take Armour Guard out completely. So each morning we would drive at six o'clock when they got there for the work. Uh, Dave would get in the boot of a car and I would park it and leave him there. Uh, we would drill holes in, in, in the boot or at the side so that he could observe the guards arriving, how many guards there was, who was the guy that unlocked, who went in, who came out. Uh, and we would then start taking the guards home, uh, following them home by stages. Tonight. Joe Symes, an armour guard employee, was the target. Barrett had used physical terror for years. Now he would be using psychological terror too. Joe Symes was followed home each night, and his family kept under constant observation. They would go down into Harlow, and I would uh, follow them to Harlow. I would stand next to them, they wouldn't know who I was. And I would listen to conversation with my back to them, and we learned bits and pieces about family and brothers and friends and what have you. In December 1985, while Joe Symes was still at work, his wife and daughter were taken hostage. The doorbell rang, Mum got up, and I heard all this commotion, and of course, the next thing I see, they had mum, you know, round the, had her round the throat sort of thing, and their arm round her like that, and had the hand over her, her mouth. I started getting hold of my handbag. They said, oh, well, you know what we're here for, and that's when it sort of clicked that they were here for, for armour guard. I was frightened, but we tried to reassure them as, as in the best way, which is, 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 is very, very hard. They were not touched. They were not manhandled. They were sat down and made a cup of tea. I was saying, look, don't hurt my mum. And, because uh, she was very, very shaken, they then took us to this table and they handcuffed us to, yeah, it was to the, um, to the leg of the table each. It's confronted armed robbers. As Croke and Barrett set up a bullion van robbery, police lay in wait. They were filmed following a Shields bullion van leaving its South London depot on the 8th of November, 1986.
The police saw them ambush the van at Newport Pagnell service station and then moved in to make their arrest further up the M1. The robbers were caught red-handed. Dave Croke was under arrest for the first time in his criminal career. Don Barrett feared that after his lenient treatment as a supergrass, he would face an exemplary sentence of 25 years. But to his amazement, the police offered him another deal. They said, you can become an SG again for the second time. You will get everything that goes with it. You will get a shorter sentence. You will go into the control units, uh, into the uh, secure units, then you will go into the SG units. You will get everything that, uh, that, that goes with it. And as I said, it was, a, it, was, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. Don Barrett has been disguised in this film. He's the only man to have gone supergrass twice. This lifelong criminal has just been released after serving seven years of a 17-year sentence. His barrister told the court there was a £250,000 contract out on his life. If someone comes looking for me, don't miss. But I'll state it here and I'll state it now, categorically. Leave me alone, I'll leave him alone. I made myself busy with me, I just made myself busy with him. Having said that, I'm going to disappear into the distance. Now that there was a real risk that they'd be grasped by their associates or shot by the police, professional criminals realised it was time to move on from armed robbery. That we almost made it, but we they saw that drugs would provide bigger profits with fewer risks. For men like former train robber Tommy Wisby, drugs will be the crime of the future. Wednesday's look into the underworld is at the earlier time of 9.30.